<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome this afternoon to a new concept for us. Uh, we are going to have a virtual town hall meeting where students can ask questions, uh, where students can uh, get responses uh, from the uh, uh, the uh, administration of Washburn University. And so we have a couple of, uh, of questions to start with. Uh, do you want to select one of the questions or uh, just give me a question that you'd like for one of the three of us uh, to address? Yeah, so we have a list of questions from some students. So we'll just go ahead and get started. I'll do the first question. <clears throat> so one question that was asked by a student is, why is Washburn raising summer tuition for in-person classes to the online class price? Okay, um, in, in the last several years, most of the teaching in summer has been uh, 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 an online program and a really, really true definition of online program. And that definition then fits into the matrix of, uh, of cost and of tuition charges. So it's nothing that's really unusual. We're gonna be teaching this year probably 80% or more of the courses online, uh, and it will then cover, uh, it'll then be paid for by the tuition charges. I, would you like me to add to that just a little bit? Go, on, go ahead. I just want to make sure uh, Victoria and Mayella and whoever else happens to be listening, just uh, to clarify that about 80% of our classes were already online um, as of uh, when, we, when we first published the schedule. And then due to COVID-19, we found that we wanted to make sure that students had the ability to take those courses when we didn't know what was going to happen over the summer. And so we, uh, we made the decision, the very tough decision, to ask our professors to move all the courses online, not just remote like we did during the semester, but actually to move them online. And so that's what we, that's what we had to do. It's not always the first uh, thing that we would do, but in the, in the COVID-19 area that we're in and environment, we felt like that's what we needed to do to make sure students could get their classes. But we were only we were only moving about twenty percent of the uh, courses because the others were already there in a already. Uh, online format. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Um. So just for those viewers, um, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mayela Campa, and I'm the vice president for the Washburn Student Government Association. But um, the next question. Um, says, um, is there any word on fan attendance at sporting events? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of questions about that. As a matter of fact, great interest in that, as it should be. Uh, particularly on a college campus, uh, athletics uh, are just a part of the experience, the residential experience on a college campus. But this goes far beyond uh, college campus. This goes into uh, professional ranks. Uh, and in, on the college side of it, the NCAA had been the one that uh, closed athletic activities this past spring, uh, about six weeks ago. And they will be, I think, I don't have anything in writing yet, but I think they will be the ones that uh, will have to open that up again if they so choose. Uh, and we hope that they will do that uh, as quickly as they can. Uh, and we're, we're going to be in May by the end of this week. And if we don't start with some of the planning for athletics, particularly football this fall, uh, then they start way behind on, uh, on all kinds of things, on the plays that they have to learn uh, to, the, uh, to the workouts that they have to, uh, have to perform. So we don't know yet, but we are, we are very hopeful uh, that we'll have college athletics on uh, Washburn campus this fall. Okay, our next question is, is COVID-19 going to affect the fall 2020 semester at all? <laughs> uh, I wish I had that crystal ball here. Uh, I didn't think it was going to affect uh, the spring semester, but we are hopeful 
that, that we will be able to start the semester with full-time face-to-face and end the semester that way. But this is something that we cannot control. Uh, this is something that is larger than really than anything else we deal with uh, in our country. So whether, the, whether this disease morphs into something else or whether it is eradicated, I don't think it will be, uh, but it is, uh, uh, it, it's possible that it will disrupt our uh, fall term. Uh, Victoria, would you like me to talk a little bit about how we might be planning for that, the professors and the different, at least as far as delivering courses? Would you like to know a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. If either you or Dr. Rossman want to pitch in, because another question that we do have is what options are, the, is the school considering if it's still a problem in the summer and the fall? Okay, I can wait for your question. That would be fine. Oh, okay. I would say go for it, Dr. Mazachek. Okay. Kind of I, I would okay, I would tell you that because uh, because we're we have a group of folks working very diligently. We started our work um, really last week and uh, in full force over the next three to four weeks, realizing that we anticipate we wish we had a crystal ball, just like Dr. Farley said, and that we knew exactly what was going to happen with COVID-19, but since we don't. We believe the next uh, best way to approach it is to plan uh, for it and, to, to, and plan in the best way that we can in case COVID-19 does affect our fall semester again. And so we have a series of six working groups right now trying to um, develop the best plans possible for the fall. Uh, we are planning to start in person, just as Dr. Farley released in the press today, and as we've been working on for several weeks, planning to start in person, but having being prepared that if the COVID-19 comes back in a way that the governor has a new order or the county has a new order, that we can provide the best learning experience to our students. And so unlike what happened in the spring where we had no idea that it was coming, We've learned from what happened in the spring and we're going to be prepared then. Every faculty member for every course will have a plan if COVID-19 does, does hit us, does come back and we have to take a hiatus from being together physically that we'll be able to deliver your education in a high quality way, in a seamless way because we will have already thought about how we might do that. And, uh, but our hope is that we will be able to go through the entire semester in person, but we'll be prepared in case we can. And, and I think because of what has happened here this spring, uh, where we didn't know what was going to occur, uh, things turned out pretty, pretty well. I mean, we're only into the fifth week now, but things turned out exceptionally well, I think. And so that gives us a little advantage when we start thinking about and talking about what we will do in the fall term if something does occur. But right now we're going all out to, uh, to be prepared either way. Yeah, we're, we're actually referring to it, uh, the term will be what we're calling it flexible course design so that it's an intentional purposeful way of putting together your course so that you can adapt during the semester to, to, uh, to the environment that, we're, that we find ourselves in. Next question. Mail out, outside the classroom, we're going to do some similar things, right? So we're going to follow with the CDC, uh, Shawnee County Health Department, and folks give us as far as meeting size and meeting groups, and, and that will impact a lot of our campus activities. Um, so as the question about athletics is going to be driven quite a bit by the NCAA and others, uh, a lot of us will drive our all of our events by Shawnee County Health and and everything else. And so we, we anticipate having events, we anticipate having activities. They may just look different than they've looked um, in the past. Yeah. Eric, and that's such a... Be, I'm sorry, go ahead, Julie. Oh, that, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Farley. I, I would tell you that I, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's one of the hard, that's one of the hard parts of the planning process for inside the classroom is if social distancing remains in place and the limit of the small or of the group gatherings, that we have to figure out how to make sure that each of you can do six foot social distancing inside of a classroom. 
and what that means for how many people can be in a classroom in addition to a professor and we're and that's part of the work that we have to do so we know no matter what the campus is going to look a little different uh, in the fall just just in respect to the just in the social distancing alone yeah that's going to be one of the if not the major factor is that physical separation between people and how we will react to that now, how can you play football and have uh, six uh, have uh, six feet of s separation between uh, between the players that just no, doesn't work doesn't work and um, uh, there will be other things on campus that the same thing is true in a, in a, in a concert if you're overperforming Victoria uh, and there are other people that are with you performing getting getting everything organized so that you can be six feet separation uh, is going to going to take some time. Next question. Okay. Um, are there any plans for a graduation ceremony at a later date, like other universities? <laughs> uh, that's probably one of the most uh, sensitive uh, questions you could ask because we all feel that we have lost something uh, forever that uh, occurred this, this past spring when we were unable to continue uh, with commencement ceremonies as we would like to have uh, and provide that kind of recognition of the accomplishments and the achievements of all of our students. Um, and we don't want that to be a forever decision. So we are looking at all sorts of different ideas that people have had around the country that we might be able to use uh, that would work for us. Uh, we've explored different options uh, uh, that we would just devise on campus and we've not came, come to a final decision uh, about how we will do that, but we are committed to try to find some way to recognize those accomplishments. And didn't didn't you see something this morning, Eric? Uh, uh, I, saw, I read an article yesterday of some people looking at how they're they're going to do it uh, without the whole arena of family and friends, uh, unfortunately. But uh, a way that we could do a photograph and and. Uh, spend a little time with, uh, with graduates. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different models out there. Um, Victoria Mayella, what we're trying to do is prevent, um, honestly, a second disappointment. You know, trying to set a schedule, trying to make something happen soon, um, which we would all prefer to do. I don't want to have to try that and then have to say, oops, sorry, the, the model doesn't let us do it again. And so not only do we get excited um, about, about that time and that energy, we, we, have, to, we have to push down the road again. And so there's, you know, we've talked about a lot of things fall semester. Again, it's going to guide from what the CDC and Shawnee County Health kind of gives us the guidance on. Yeah, I guess I just want to say I can't can't pass it up, especially on behalf of your faculty and and the people who've spent many years uh, watching uh, students uh, start from when they're a freshman until you till you're ready to go off into your career and do professional discipline or graduate school and. And it truly is, as Dr. Farley and Dr. Grosvich said, it's our favorite event of the entire year is when we get to celebrate with all of you and all of the graduates, uh, everything that they've worked so hard for and, and get to celebrate with their families. And, and it is uh, such a disappointment for us to miss uh, providing that opportunity to and celebrating along with you. And, and uh, we do have a lot of plans uh, ahead. Uh, that we are we are working on. We just unfortunately, due to the uncertainty, we're not ready to announce a date or or a plan. But we uh, assure you, we remain committed to that. Let me let me suggest something. Uh, we have a number of Mr. Ichabod statues all around campus. Get a photograph with your friends. Get a photograph with your parents. Get a photograph just you and Mr. Ichabod at each maybe maybe each one of them, and then have people guess at where they found all of those Ichabods. I can think of four right now uh, that are scattered around the campus. So go get a photo made with Mr. Ichabod. That's a great suggestion. So one student asked in the worst case scenario, will students be charged online tuition prices if they cannot come back to campus in the fall? Dr. Maschek, would you, we talked about that this morning. Would you like to address that? We did. So 
So I will just tell you, uh, following up on what Dr. Farley shared at the very beginning, um, it, the only time that online uh, rate will kick in is when that course is planned to be online from the very beginning. So if we have to do a pivot right um, at the beginning, say we had to do it right at the beginning of the semester, those courses will have been planned to be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So that would be uh, the charge that would happen. But any courses that are planned to be online, that, that, is, um, that, that, that gets charged the online rate. And we do have classes that are online every semester. About 20% of our, of our credit hours are online credit hours. That's, and those, uh, any courses that are planned that way. And we have, we have several online programs. It's the only way that we deliver uh, the program. So those, uh, those all do, um, do pay the online tuition rate. Unless there's something really unusual that occurs, we will very likely uh, use the same model that, we, that Dr. Masterjack just said and that we followed. Uh, this past spring. So when, when you went home for uh, a spring break and started taking the course when you came back and it was a, a remotely driven model, um, you, you'd already paid, you'd already been billed. And so that was at the normal, normal rate. Or you would have paid and been billed for a class that was an online course. So it, we've already got experience with this. And, and unless, unless somehow at midnight on the, before the first day of classes, something odd occurred, uh, we'll do just what we said a moment ago. It'll be what, you're, what you've signed up for. Mm -hmm. So at this time, that does conclude all of our questions. I just wanted to open the floor to any of you if you have anything else that you want to add to this town hall. I, 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 I guess we could, we could talk a little bit about um, uh, safety and health, and I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Dr. Grosvich in just a moment. We are very concerned. Our, our campus, you know, the or we th we're expecting that the order by the governor is going to be lifted, and we're expecting that the order in our county will be lifted, and we'll move into phase two of this five-phase program, and that will start to reopen campus. And as we we have those conversations about bringing uh, even staff, then faculty, then students back to campus that, that our overarching concern is um, making sure that we're doing all of the precautionary uh, measures that we possibly can to keep the environment, the learning environment and the working environment as safe as we possibly can. Uh, Dr. Grosvich will be leading an effort on behalf of the campuses as a whole, Washburn and Washburn Tech. And I didn't know, Eric, if you wanted to share just a few thoughts about that. You know, I think that um, it's some of the things that, fortunately, I've talked to President uh, Smith and, and Vice President Campa about a little bit is just what will fall look like and and how do we engage in those things. We've talked a little bit today about social distancing, you know, following the guidance of the CDC and, and who about, um, I guess you say WHO, not just who, um, as it relates to campus safety or safety in general. Um, and trying to trying to follow those pieces, and so I think the bigger challenge as we work with student government over the next over the summer and, and conversations is going to be, you know, what what does that look like, and how do we engage students mm -hmm. in this? Mm -hmm. um, because we can provide um, environments, but unfortunately, we worry about disease, not just COVID, but we've mm -hmm. paid attention to mumps, we've paid attention to meningitis, we've paid attention to another of other communicable diseases that impact college campuses across the country. COVID is just much the most current and probably the scariest um, in a lot of ways. And so I think that uh, working together will be an important piece as we develop those processes um, to make sure that you all are engaged in the conversation to see where we're going um, and getting that feedback as it goes forward. Uh, what you just said is, is outstanding. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about how we deal with that if you're in the residence halls. How will we handle residence hall occupancy? Well, I think we're still working through, um, again, following some of the guidelines that we've seen nationally about what what will that look like as far as roommates and structures and so forth. But but right now, anytime we would see, we'll use mumps as an example, anytime we had a student who was diagnosed with mumps, uh, we have processes about isolation, we have processes about how to make sure they have food, uh, that they're well taken care of, and everything else in the times that 
uh, that they need that feedback. And that's where our student health services come into play. And honestly, the benefit of having a, a very strong nursing program on campus really guides us through those conversations as well. And so uh, I think uh, Vice President Camp has asked me in the past just about what would we do. Uh, we're working through all those things this summer. We're going to follow best practices from across the country um, to look at how do we develop isolation spaces if, if that becomes a case. How do we work with our students who, you know, the first, first signs of a temperature, what does that look like? Um, unfortunately, the regular flu, um, allergy season, um, all of those other things are going to cause us to cough and sniff and, and have concerns, not just, um, not just everything's related to COVID. Because as of this point, we've still been very fortunate in that none of our faculty, staff, or community or students have been diagnosed or have been tested positive mm -hmm. for the COVID um, COVID nineteen uh, virus. And so, I think we've we've been fortunate in that standpoint, and we're going to continue to work to provide what we can to move that forward. Someone sent a question uh, just to keep you going here, Eric. Um, uh, what happens if uh, we have to evacuate the residence hall uh, in the middle of the semester? Uh, does a student owe all the money for the residence hall and the food, or is there some uh, other plan that we're working on? Well, twofold. One, uh, we're going to, again, we're going to follow what Shawnee County Health and other folks provide us as guidance this time around. Um, it won't be the initial um, Let's just get everybody gone, um, which is what the, the model was this spring. I think we're having some different conversations about that. Um, otherwise, then I would advocate the same way we did this, spr this spring is that with the communications with WSGA um, and talking a little bit about um, policies, we credited the students the accounts from the day that we, we closed the buildings once they've picked up all their belongings, uh, once they've vacated the space. And so my hope would be that um, through testing, through other safety measures, that we wouldn't have to do that again. Um, one, because we've seen our students miss, uh, miss that level of engagement. Uh, we know our faculty have missed engaging with students. Um, and so even if we can't be in, in large groups, our hope is that we can maintain uh, some level of engagement with each other on campus. Does, uh, uh, does this include everyone on campus has to wear a mask? I think that is going to be one of the things. <laughs> you know, I, I would actually be interested in Victoria and Mayello's response about how do you think we could get, could we get students um, and folks to wear masks? But you know, again, we're going to follow what the CDC and Shawnee County Health Guidelines are. That's part of our Health and Safety Committee's uh, charge to look at what does that mean. Um, there are some legal ramifications when we start talking about taking people's temperatures. Um, and from a, from a privacy standpoint that we'll have to work through with general counsel. Uh, but I do think that um, I would ask our students, what's the likelihood of me um, getting students to wear masks when they are um, in classrooms or just walking about campus? Personally, I, I wear a mask everywhere I go just because I am immune system compromised. Um, so I think that there won't be a whole lot of pushback but that's just on me, like from like a personal standpoint of someone who could catch this and could get very ill. Well, that's what we would we want. It, uh, I, I would think it'd be a little more difficult to mandate that everyone must have a must have a mask, uh, but we can certainly encourage people, and and just by example, we can uh, we can encourage people. I didn't I didn't bring my mask in here, but I've had him checked. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> uh, there he goes. All right. Um, but uh, the, the other thing that, that we can do is pass along some friendly uh, advice. Uh, first one I would take is don't drink Clorox. Please. <laughs> yeah. that, that creates a different level of, a, a different level of issue. Uh, that, was, that was also a joke, guys. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> Is there, uh, is there any uh, uh, plans to station uh, anti-germ uh, Purell or something around, uh, around, the, uh, around the campus and how, how will we uh, uh, clean uh, between classes or after each day's classes have, have ended? So I think that's part of that larger health and safety committee. 
uh, that we're, we're developing and, and kind of getting off the ground. Because there's a couple things. One, I think we did a lot of great work um, really in the spring when we saw this coming um, of increasing hand sanitizers, increasing some of those um, other pieces. But the, the difficult process here is that we could wipe down a desk and as soon as somebody touches it, then, then yeah. we're right back to we're right back to where we were. And so, right. I think working through our our, custom, our campus facility staff to develop those processes will be important. Uh, but the the bigger piece and the bigger piece I'll probably lean on WSGA to help with is that personal responsibility piece. You know, the washing your hands, the trying to not touch your face, the the, the acknowledging some of those social distance requirements when what you really want to do is hug your friend. You know, how do we how do we work through those those standpoints will be a, a a critical piece as we go ahead. Let's see one uh, from outside our group here uh, submitted questions that we can uh, respond to at none, Jeff Hoare. I, I, President Smith. That was all the questions that I received. So um, I guess at this point we have concluded the town hall. So thank you. Thank all for you. joining us and answering the questions and we're very excited to see the students response to this thank good you for, you. for making this happen yeah thanks a lot we enjoyed being with you thank you all yeah bye-bye bye-bye